It has been a summer of strikes in Los Angeles. For the first time in 40 years, employees in the city are going on a 24 hour strike demanding higher wages. Yeah, those workers are joining the ongoing hotel workers, writers and actors who have already gone on strike. ABC's Melissa Adan has the story from Los Angeles. Picket lines filling Los Angeles International Airport Tuesday as thousands of LA city workers walked off the job. Sanitation workers, bus drivers, traffic officers, and many more holding a 24 hour strike to highlight what they're calling unfair labor practices. The goal of today is to tell the city that we want to be respected when we go to the bargaining table. They're overworking me, overworking others, and it's affecting our family lives. The union is calling for better pay and benefits amid the high cost of living. They've negotiated in bad faith, meaning that they've brought folks to the table that weren't able to e even have the authority to settle uh, certain agreements. This latest job action coming on top of the 11,000 writers, 160,000 actors, and 15,000 hotel workers also on the picket lines. The striking unions showing the power of organized labor, but it's also impacting the economy. The makeup, the hair, the grips, the electrics, you know, people who work the long hours and have nowhere to go right now. Nowhere to go while we while we fight this out. Fall film and TV programming is now in jeopardy. The show Jeopardy says without its writing staff this fall, it will be reusing old clues and former contestants. The LA mayor insists that they are bargaining in good faith and assures that the city won't shut down, but is warning Angelinos that city services like parking enforcement and trash pickup will be delayed. Melissa Don, ABC News, Los Angeles. All right, by the way, I want to mention that we're having some technical difficulties with some of our video. That's why we don't have a sports cast today at six. And hopefully Larry Ramirez will be back here on the night beat. But yeah, we want you to stick around because we'll see you on the other side of this break. Welcome back. 630 now. Time for our KSAT Q&A. Joining us live is San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Mr. Mayor, always appreciate your time. You know, we, I want to start with the question about the heat. It's what everybody's talking about. It's on everybody's mind. Your concerns right now, and do they go from not only the citizens of San Antonio and South Texas, but to the power grid? Sure. Well, as you know, we've been making records lately with the heat wave that we've had in the heat dome. I uh, just read today that we set a new record, the one that we broke last year with days over 105. So the heat is intense uh, and it's dangerous. And we're making sure that folks know the signs of heat illness, uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, uh, making sure that they are aware of the importance of hydration, also, the fact that we've got cooling centers, cooling locations all around town, 80 plus places where people can go to cool down. And if you don't have transportation to get there, call 311, we can get you. Uh, but it is dangerous heat. Of course, there's always the concern about uh, the stability of the ERCOT grid, the state grid. Um, CPS Energy continues to produce and provide uh, electricity for folks around our city. Uh, but we do have responsibilities to the state grid if there are outages in other parts of the, the state. And with the demand at record levels going higher and higher, uh, ERCOT has put out the message that, um, you know, people should be conserving where they can. Uh, so there is a, you know, a, a level of anxiety that I know that people have. Um, I, I would say that, you know, if it was all CPS's responsibility, we'd be okay. Uh, but we've got to make sure that po folks around the state are also doing their part uh, to produce the energy and also uh, ensure that their customers are conserving where it's possible. All right, but let's talk about some things that uh, San Antonians and also um, city leaders can do to help this. Because it's not just that it's super hot, it's the sustained prolonged heat that, right. you know, if we're talking about heat related illnesses, that's going to, that, that would affect our hospitals. We're also talking about businesses. We've had food trucks, mm -hmm. people that have small businesses that are suffering. Uh, we had a lady a few weeks ago that couldn't, she had an ice cream shop, couldn't even run it because it just wasn't cool enough in there. So what, no. what is your, what, what are city leaders prepared to do to help San Antonians and what can you ask San Antonians to do to help the situation while we're here? Yeah, well, number one, make sure that people know the signs of, of heat illness. That's number one is, is just personal safety. And so um, that includes making those cooling centers available for folks who don't have a cool place to go. 
libraries, uh, splash pads, uh, public pools, uh, the places that the city offers. There's 80, there's 80 around town. And if folks don't have a way to get there, we will come and get them in partnership with VIA. So uh, there are ways of getting around town to, to ensure that they're in cooling locations. Now, with respect to resources to run businesses and to meet the demand uh, for both energy and water, we're asking folks to be conscious of their use. Um, you know, conserve where you can uh, during high energy peak periods where we get warned by ERCOT. We want folks, if they can, to set their thermostats a little higher. Um, you know, we, it's it's a little uncomfortable in my house uh, uh, during the evenings now, but we've got to do what we can to conserve and make sure that we can meet the demand, uh, not just in San Antonio, but uh, folks around the state. So uh, we're going to do everything we can to meet meet the, the need here. And I think we are in, in good shape with the responsibility of our neighbors uh, all around town. But but again, everybody's got to be conscious and aware. And the most important thing, again, is to make sure that they're aware of the signs of heat illness uh, that includes heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and the importance of staying hydrated. You know, yesterday, Mr. Mayor, when you're bringing, we're talking about all this, if, you know, we talked to meteorologist Adam Kasky about, it. I mean, is this the new normal? I mean, I know a lot of people don't yeah. want to talk about climate change. They don't want to acknowledge climate change. So we kind of left that off the board and just talked about the fact that this well, is the new normal. And so uh, how as a city do you prepare for summers after summers like this? And this may be, you know, Stephanie, to get more direct to your question, the, the responsibilities of a, of a, you know, the city government and VIA, et cetera, uh, we're doing work to make sure that we increase tree plantings. Uh, we've got an additional uh, tranche of resources that council just voted on uh, to increase tree canopy around town. One of VIA's top missions right now among ever, all is to ensure that their bus shelters are providing some shade uh, to make sure that people are out of the elements who are waiting for the bus. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, not just in San Antonio, just around the country on the urban heat island effect. So we've got some pilot programs uh, to test things like cooler pavement uh, coatings. So there's a lot of work just on infrastructure. And the way we used to do things perhaps back in the 80s and 90s is not working anymore simply because of the growth of the city, uh, the amount of blacktop you see all over the state, including in San Antonio, and the fact that, yeah, the, the, the climate has changed. Um, 105 degree days uh, in a string, uh, hitting a record after consecutive years of doing the same. Uh, this heat is intense, it's unrelenting, and it's not something that we've seen before. The temperature has markedly increased, and, and uh, the meteorologists and, and the researchers tell us that and it's evident in, in, in their research. So as you see this problem, it's becoming a, a bigger problem. This year has been super hot, people are suffering. So then that would mean that the city government would also have to sp increase its budget when it comes to any issues regarding this particular issue. So I'm wondering, since we, we're in, you're in the midst of uh, budget talks, yeah. what are your priorities and how much, and what are you doing? Are you gonna add anything more uh, as we fight climate change to your budget? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we did was really kind of redirect some funds that were already coming into the city last year. We created a resiliency uh, and environmental um, sustainability fund, the RES fund, uh, that is essentially revenue that was being uh, generated through CPS. And so we have roughly $10 million a year now going to pilot and implement certain um, measures to reduce the urban heat island. I, measured, I mentioned a couple of them, but we're also going to be testing some innovations as well for that. Um, one of my colleagues has just put forward a, po a proposal uh, for green alleyways. We've got uh, some infrastructure work going on in, in alleyways across the city. How can we use that as an opportunity to reduce urban heat island effect? Uh, but to be honest, uh, Stephanie, the, the priorities of the budget this year uh, include improving public safety, improving infrastructure. We've just got to change the way we do things all across the country. And with respect to infrastructure, we've got to make it more resilient. We've got to pay closer attention to increasing uh, and preserving green space, which also reduces that urban heat island effect. So it's really a change in the way we think about how we build cities these days in light of what we've seen through the changing climate. As we're talking about the budget, I'm going to kind of make a segue from sure. climate and uh, kind of some of the things we're doing to public safety. I know that they're in the budget. You have asked and a lot. I think there seems to be an effort to increase 
the police force to hire more officers and San Antonio seems yeah. to be, you know, we've seen it in polling. San Antonio wants accountability for our police force, but they also support the police force. Right. How many officers are you talking about? And is that sustainable past year one? I know that a lot of federal dollars are going to be used to add some of these officers. Can we still pay for that down the line, though, when those federal dollars aren't there? Well, public safety is job number one for any city government, and so it will remain that way. And, and that we hope we get some relief from the uh, federal grants that we receive. Uh, but in the event that that doesn't happen, uh, we're going to continue with the priority being public safety. Let me tell you, we are working with UTSA and doing some analysis of staffing levels. And they have recommended that over the course of about three to five years, we're going to add about 360 uh, officers to the patrol division. And the purpose for that is to uh, change the, the ratio of proactive to reactive patrolling that happens in the city. Right now, we're about 40 percent proactive to 60 percent reactive, meaning that 60 percent of the time that an officer's on the street, he's actively he or she is actively responding to a call. We're going to flip that ratio. And in order to do that, obviously, we need more personnel in patrol. So we're going to start that effort in a big way this year. We've got another, another 100 officer positions uh, that we're putting into this year's budget. Um, the city council will hear the first uh, presentation on the proposed budget uh, on Thursday. It'll start to, the process to go through public town halls. So if you're interested in this part of the budget or anything else, please go to one of those town halls and let us know your thoughts. Um, but, you know, that's one element of policing. There are other elements of, of, of public safety that we're also analyzing right now. We'll make some augments, uh, augments okay. uh, to, to the, the budget in, that, in, the, in light of those results when they come in as well. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have to wrap up, but I'd be remiss not to ask you this question. Uh, so I looked it up. It is almost about 20 degrees cooler in D.C. right now. You've been to D.C., so you know the scuttlebutt around town is that you're being courted by the Biden administration. Can we have a response to that? And if they offer you a position, will you take it? So uh, number one, I don't pay attention to the, any of the speculation. Uh, number two, the only reason I got into um, politics and public service is because I love the city. I don't want to devote my time to making it the greatest city uh, in the world. And so that's where my focus will be. I have no plans to be anywhere but San Antonio over the next two years. Budgets, Biden, climate change. I think we covered a lot today, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And uh, birds up and go Spurs go. There you go. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're going to take a live look outside near the San Antonio International Airport. You see it there. 103 degrees. I just checked on the website and it looks like things at our airport are running pretty smoothly. There was just a one delay to a flight uh, to Phoenix, but everything else looks to be OK, which is good considering it's hot. Although I don't know why you'd want to go to Phoenix. I was going to say if there's actually, one place that's actually warmer. Than yes, San Antonio, it's Phoenix. Y yeah, but it it's a dry heat. No, <laughs> okay, which yeah. is different. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was there in June and it was 110-ish, you know, and it, it felt better than what we had around here with all that humidity in June. That's just my personal opinion. 103 right now by nine o'clock, still 95. Midnight, we're at 84 degrees tomorrow morning, right near 80. We're going to talk about the record highs likely to fall in just a bit. All right, thank you for joining us again. 647 right now. We'll send things back on over to meteorologist Adam Kasky. Hot. Another mm -hmm. record breaking day I, today. You know what? You, yeah, when you brought up Phoenix, yep. I hear what you're saying, but 111 is hot no matter where yeah, you I are. I know. It's still hot. Your clothes yeah, still, still stick to your yeah. skin. Uh, it's I know. uncomfortable. I know. You're right. It's still hot. I guess it's the preference. You want it a little hotter and really dry or not with a little bit more moisture. OK, yeah. anyway, we could go on and debate that forever. Let's talk about our day today. 105 was our high. That's a record by one degree. The average 97 and keep in mind, this is the time of year, climatologically speaking, where it's the warmest in San Antonio, with, where we have the warmest average high, which is now at 97. 100 degree day count is up to 43 now. 
Tomorrow we'll make 44. We'll keep tallying them up. The next benchmark is 57, which was back in 2011. And of course, the most was 59 back in 09. There's still a frontal boundary to the north of us. It's pushed northward a little bit. Remember yesterday it was in North Texas. Now it's moved northward. So Oklahoma City on the quote, cool side of it, the not as hot side, 87, even Wichita, Kansas, 88. So it's separating 80s from 100s. Abilene, 107. Lubbock at 100 degrees, Dallas 103, Austin 104. You get the idea. We're still in the triple digits. Catula's 109, Carrizo Springs at 108. Tomorrow morning, we start the day right near 80. We think 79 at 7 a.m. And then by noon, we're at 94, a lot of sunshine, making it to 105. And that would be one degree shy of the record for the day tomorrow. So we're not forecasting the record tomorrow. Is it within reach and within the realm of possibility? Absolutely, but our going forecast is just one degree shy of that record high for the day. One of five for most of us tomorrow with give or take a degree. You get up into the hill country, shave off a few degrees up in Comfort, 103, even Bull Verde, 102, but Canyon Lake about 104. And this trend continues, actually 106 for highs Thursday and Friday. And then we'll see a little downtrend, but only dropping down to 103 and 102 by early next week. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, by the way, we are expecting to tie or exceed the record highs. And that's a time when there's going to be added stress to our electric grid. Now, we haven't had any issues this summer. We're not expecting issues. No, we're not expecting them. But th their supply and demand is going to get pretty close. You see the projected supply in blue there and then the projected demand in red. And it's going to get close, so just a good reminder that between 3 and 8 p.m., try to conserve energy. There was some good rain in Oklahoma and even Arkansas last night and early this morning. Unfortunately, that wasn't headed our way. And then even in New Mexico, they're getting some good moisture there. It's monsoon season. That upper level high, it's going to be relentless, keeping us sunny, hot, and dry. The afternoon relative humidity drops, though, which is nice. So that keeps the heat index in check. Relentless is a good word. Mm -hmm. for where we're at heat wise right now. This is true. We'll be right back after the break. This is a milestone that not many people reach, and that is their 104th birthday. Helen Tinsley had the privilege of celebrating her 104 years of life over the weekend. The Kentucky native was born in 1919 to a farmer and his homemaker wife. Helen and her husband spent most of their lives in Louisville, but she moved to a health care facility in Clarksville, Indiana recently. Her family says she's still a spitfire. She credits her longevity to a clean lifestyle, never smoking, and only the occasional drink. She also eats a clove of garlic each day. Garlic, is that what's in those cupcakes? I don't think that's, I don't mm. know. I don't think there's garlic in there, but you never know. All right, tonight, Mega Millions drawing could bring the largest jackpot in the game's history. The whopping prize, an estimated $1.55 billion. It comes after no ticket matched all six numbers on Friday. So if one ticket wins the jackpot, the lump sum payment is going to be an estimated $757 million. The current Mega Millions record of nearly $1.54 billion was won in South Carolina back in 2018. And the drawing takes place at 10 o'clock tonight. And when we get on here on the night beat, we're going to bring you those winning numbers. Yep, we'll have the numbers. We'll be right back, though, at 6. A reminder, another yellow day, CPS Energy Peak Energy Demand Day. So do what you can to conserve energy between 3 and 8 p.m. Because no surprise here, it's going to be backed up to 105, the high temperature, which would be shy of the record by one degree, then 106 by Thursday, Friday. By the way, it's National Whataburger Day, and it is their 73rd birthday. Number two with Love jalapeno. Celebrate. Have a good night.